Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jim McGovern, and I want to welcome you to this uh, to this hearing today. I apologize for being a little bit late, but we just finished votes, and um, uh, I'm a little bit out of breath and out of shape too, I think. So, um, uh, but I want to welcome everybody. I want to thank you for attending this important hearing on the threats faced by civil society and human rights defenders. I want to thank the many activists, non-governmental organizations, congregations, and journalists who work through peaceful means to make their countries better. You are, the, uh, you are unsung heroes, and I deeply appreciate everything you do to promote and protect universally recognized human rights, to document and expose human rights violations, and to hold governments accountable. And I greatly admire your courage and your leadership. In particular, I want to thank Ru 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 RuPaul Mehta and Kate Hickson and the staff, Jordan Tam Tamman and the whole staff of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission for organizing this hearing. And I want to thank our witnesses for their leadership in working to support civil society and human rights. Uh, civil society is essential to democracy and can help improve lives and empower citizens in countless, in countless ways. Civil society and human rights defenders play a key role in fostering democracy, mobilizing people around human rights issues, and ensuring that governments live up to their commitments. When governments crack down on the rights of citizens to engage in basic civic activities, it is not only human rights that are undermined, Civil society um, uh, restrictions also tend to limit political and economic progress more broadly. Unfortunately, in many countries, civil society organizations face increasing restrictions, while human rights defenders themselves are threatened, censored, detained, tortured, and even killed. As more governments draft restrictive laws, civil society organizations are finding it more difficult to carry out their important work. Governments need to see civic activists as partners and not as opponents. Governments need to understand that collaboration with civil society is not a sign of weakness, but that it is, that it is essential to a strong democracy. When NGOs come under threat, governments should, should provide protection where they can. Human rights defenders in particular face serious difficulties in many places, from China to Russia, from Bahrain to Mexico, from Egypt to Zimbabwe, and in dozens of other countries, governments are pre preventing human rights defenders from carrying out their critical work as protectors of fundamental freedoms. In addition to examining the issue from a global perspective during this hearing, we've chosen to look more in depth at a couple of countries where conditions are very challenging for civil society and human rights defenders. In Ethiopia and Colombia, activists work under extreme pressure, often experiencing human rights abuses themselves. In 2009, Ethiopia passed the Charities and Societies Proclamation Law which has changed the, uh, the face of civil society in Ethiopia. It violates Ethiopia's constitution and international human rights obligations. It is so restrictive that not even well-respected NGOs have been able to successfully register, forcing organizations to cut programs, close offices, and lay off staff. The, inter the International Center uh, for Not-for-Profit Law notes that Colombia is one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a human rights defender, with dozens of defenders murdered each year. There were 239 reported attacks on human rights defenders in Colombia in 2011. In addition, human rights defenders in the country face criminal prosecu prosecutions, violations uh, of the home, and interference with communi communications. This hearing is an opportunity to examine the precarious situation facing civil society activists and human rights defenders in Ethiopia, Colombia, and other countries, and to consider ways to support these unsung heroes more strongly. I would like to welcome our first panel of administration witnesses. I am grateful to these witnesses and their colleagues at the State Department and the U.S. Agency for International Development for their leadership in support of civil society and human rights defenders. The Commission looks forward to hearing about the administration's recently launched strategic dialogue with civil society, which elevates the importance of the government's work with civil society and, resource and reinforces the U.S. commitment to protect and defend civil society worldwide. We also look forward to hearing from the uh, State Department and USAID about their important efforts to support human rights defenders and civil society groups on the ground. Our first uh, witnesses uh, will be, um, and not necessarily in the order they're going to speak, but in the order they're listed here, uh, Donald Steinberg, Deputy Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. Our sec uh, we also have with us Michael Posner, Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor at the State Department. And we have uh, Tom Tom Tomika uh, Tillman, a senior advisor to Secretary of State for Civil Society and Emerging, Emerging Democracies. Dr. Tillman, is, is, it is wonderful to see you carrying out uh, the terrific work of your grandfather, Tom Lantos, who this commission is uh, named after, a man who um, 
I admired uh, greatly. I still admire his legacy and all that he's done in support of democracy and, and human rights. And we are also thrilled to have your grandmother, uh, Annette Lantos, here, who is also, in her own right, a great champion of human rights, who um, I remember for as far back as, I, as there was a human rights caucus before a commission, uh, that uh, she, was at, she attended virtually every one of them um, and was very much a driving force behind making sure that human rights stayed front and center in this Congress. So it's, uh, it's great to have the witnesses and this wonderful audience. We have a very uh, full hearing today with six witnesses providing testimony, and, and given that, I ask each of you to keep your oral testimony to five minutes or so. Um, uh, your written testimony will be submitted in the record, and um, Mr. Posner, we will begin with you. Great. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chairman McGovern, and also for your lifelong commitment to these issues. This is a, an important hearing. In this country, we talk about political activists, journalists, bloggers, human rights activists, public interest lawyers, medicines, and so on. These distinctions don't really mean much in most of the world, where the more meaningful divide is between citizens who dare to come together to engage in public dialogue and those who remain silent. And around the world, the ranks of those who are engaged is growing, uh, and they are playing a critical role. These are important groups, and it's important that we support them. Uh, but it's not surprising that many governments find their activities threatened. Some react by blaming outside forces for violating their sovereignty, stirring up dissent. Uh, to, to, these, to us, these groups gather information, amplify voices that have too long been silent. But to some governments, they pose a threat to stability. And this hearing, I think, looks at that we face. This is a challenging time in countries of the Arab uh, awakening and around the world, from Astana to Colombo, from Addis Ababa to Russia to Egypt to China. Governments have taken steps to quash freedom of expression, assembly, and uh, association. Since last December, Egypt has undertaken legal action against several U.S., Egyptian, and other NGOs, and in countries as diverse as Russia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Kyrgyzstan, Venezuela, and Vietnam, there are either new laws that have been introduced or additional restrictions are now being proposed. This pushback from governments comes in several forms. Some are making it tougher to form NGOs. Others are trying to actively constrain foreign funding. Other governments are taking measures to restrict freedom of assembly or freedom of expression. Uh, all of these uh, restrictions are neither new nor unexpected. But there are clearly a range of states that are employing these measures in greater numbers than we've seen before. I think our message today is that we need to hold our nerve and we need to sustain our engagement with these citizens who continue to advocate peacefully for change from within their own societies. I just want to end with a couple of words of what we're trying to do in, in the Obama administration. We don't support political parties or candidates. What we do is to support the right of individuals to exercise their fundamental freedoms of expression, association, and assembly, and to bring peaceful change in their own political system. We do this, and, and in the Bureau of Human Rights, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, this is
Third, we raise these issues in multilateral forums. We play a leading role at the UN in creating last year's Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Association, which is the new position that will look at these issues. We do it with public diplomacy, like this hearing, and again, I commend you for holding this hearing. And finally, we do it there are, through our programs. We now have four or five uh, initiatives, uh, including the Lifeline Fund, which is called the Embattled NGO Assistance We've managed to recruit 14 other donor governments uh, to help us build a, a pool of about $5 million to help NGOs when they get in trouble. Another set of funds deal with NGOs working on LGBT issues, yet another working on women's freedom issues. Uh, we've been successful in some places, and I'm glad to talk about these in the questions and answers. I would cite in particular Cambodia, where two years ago we helped local NGOs challenged a restricted NGO law uh, that we've managed to hold uh, now at bay for two years. But our successes and failures are neither permanent nor guaranteed. Um, it's important for us to stay the course and remain vigilant and tenacious. And we benefit by your involvement this moment of Congress in reinforcing our best interests. So again, I want to thank you for holding this hearing and a pleasure. Thank you. thank you very much. And just want the uh, Audience know we've been joined by Congressman Bonamici of uh, Oregon, and we're happy to have her here. Mr. Tillman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to begin by thanking you and the Commission for the opportunity to testify today. If you will forgive a moment of personal privilege, my late grandfather did not know that this body would be created before he passed away, but I'm confident that few things would have pleased him more than seeing the Commission carry on his commitment to the cause of human rights. And in the context of today's talk, We are coming together this afternoon at a moment of profound change. The world is witnessing a fundamental renegotiation of the power relationships that have historically defined interactions between citizens and governments. Advances in technology and shifts in culture are providing individuals with access to new sources of information and new tools for activism. And as a result, citizens' expectations for governments and governance are shifting. Civil society has been at the forefront on. Social networking sites, microblogs, and mobile phones are making it easier and cheaper than ever before for individuals to hold governments accountable and advance the common good. And as this occurs, civil society groups are emerging as a powerful catalyst for global change. Now, it should not come as a surprise that many governments confronting these dynamics are pushing back aggressively against civil society organizations and their demands for increased accountability. Over the last several years, as we've heard, more than 50 governments have either introduced or considered legislation that imposed constraints on the work of civil society organizations or limited their ability to receive funding. These and other regulatory threats constitute a clear and present danger to the work of civil society. And Assistant Secretary Posner discussed how we are acting through a variety of mechanisms to address these challenges. At the same time, uh, at the State Department, we are working to reaffirm the centrality of civil society in our own diplomacy. Last February, Secretary Clinton launched a new strategic dialogue with civil society. This initiative, modeled on our dialogues with key bilateral partners, is designed to elevate our engagement with civil society alongside our work with governments. 
Over the past year, senior department officials, including Assistant Secretary Posner, have come together with civil society representatives under the auspices of the dialogue to address issues including democracy and human rights, religion and foreign policy, governance and accountability, empowering women, and labor issues. Civil society working groups on these issues have developed concrete policy recommendations. And yesterday, at the launch of the Strategic Dialogue's 2012 Summit, Secretary Clinton announced action on the first eight of these recommendations before a worldwide audience of civil society representatives. More details on these recommendations are available on the State Department's website, but I'll mention just a few highlights. We will be providing more extensive systematic training for State Department personnel on how to engage religious communities and protect religious freedom. This training will be offered both at the Foreign Service Institute and online, and it will facilitate our diplomatic outreach to faith communities around the world. We will be expanding our efforts to encourage countries undergoing political transitions to enshrine equal citizenship for all in their new constitutions. As part of this work, we will be launching new Arabic language information efforts to support full and equal rights for women. We will be coming together with other partners to institutionalize a platform for dialogue with representatives from labor and business groups at G20 summits. We will be developing new opportunities for South-South cooperation on labor issues, and beginning with 10 posts around the world, we will be establishing mission-based civil society working groups within the dialogue to address issues of local and regional importance. Our strategic dialogue with civil society already involves more than 50 bureaus and offices at the State Department and USAID. It is providing us with a platform for translating the insights of civil society into our foreign policy, and we are looking forward to expanding this important initiative. We are also increasing our engagement with the community of democracies and other international bodies that provide frameworks for multilateral cooperation with civil society. Within the community of democracies, we and other like-minded governments are now working alongside civil society and task forces to strengthen new democracies in Moldova and Tunisia and tackle a range of other challenges. These efforts are providing a model for countries around the world of how government and civil society can come together to deliver results for the citizens we serve. We know this work will not be easy, and we recognize that while there have been pockets of excellence in our, uh, in our government on these issues, in many respects this is uncharted terrain. By comparison, government-to-government -government diplomacy has been around for a very long time, and we are still developing tools to collaborate with civil society. But as we survey the vital contributions civil society has made to expanding human rights and opportunity in our own country, it's easy to see why this work is so important. So let me conclude where I began. We are living through a moment of profound change. We realize that some governments are working to prevent this change, but at the State Department, we are working to embrace it and the opportunity it prevents, presents for our countries and for civil society. And we look forward to working with you to support civil society as an integral element of democracy and an essential guardian of human rights. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I think your grandfather would be, be very proud that you're testifying before this, uh, this commission today. Um, Mr. Steinberg. Thank you, Mr. Congressman, Madam Congresswoman. Uh, I, too, welcome this hearing uh, and salute you for shining a spotlight on this disturbing trend that you've described already uh, of growing restrictions on the space for civil society institutions in a number of countries around the world, as well as physical threats against citizens who step forward to demand change. In 1990, I was serving as the foreign policy advisor to House Majority Leader Richard Gephardt, and I had the honor to travel with Mr. Gephardt, as well as Tom and Annette Lantos, to Budapest, Prague, Warsaw, and Berlin, literally within days of the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was a unique pleasure and a privilege to see the changes through the eyes of Tom and Annette Lantos, who were true regional heroes. In Prague, we sat down in a beer hall with Ivan Havel and other leaders of the Civic Forum. Tom Lantos's first question was, when did they plan to turn their movement into a political party and take over the government? 
Havel and his colleagues seemed baffled. Over the next hour, they explained to us that their goal wasn't to simply step into the shoes of the authoritarians. It was about diffusing power throughout society to lawyers, journalists, religious leaders, labor unions, business people, artists, ethnic groups, and yes, playwrights. It was all about creating space for citizens to run their own lives. I think about that trip frequently and especially when I take a trip in my current role. I've had the opportunity over the last year to sit down with Afro-Colombians and indigenous people in Colombia, independent media and human rights lawyers in Georgia, displaced persons in South Sudan, disabled people and LGBT activists in Vietnam, and women and other activists, including youth, steps away from Tahrir Square in Egypt. It's interesting because all their comments mirror that Prague Beer Hall. These heroes are demanding a role in shaping their lives, their nations, and their futures. As you've pointed out, it's a disturbing paradox that at a time of exploding social media and open communications, Many governments are seeking to place draconian restrictions on civil society. And my colleagues have already outlined some of the most disturbing situations. And they've addressed primarily the human rights and political aspects. So for my part, I wanted to focus on the developmental aspects. During three decades of work in this arena, I've learned a number of things. First, I've learned that development simply works better and is more sustainable when it draws on the full richness of civil society, involving people as planners, implementers, and beneficiaries. No government has a monopoly on good ideas, financial resources, ground truth, or moral authority. In too many of these countries, civil society are the eyes, the ears, and the conscience of their communities. In addition, civil society plays a vital watchdog role against governmental abuse, corruption, inefficiency, and they hold government officials accountable. Civil society also knows that development doesn't just mean six and eight and 10% per capita growth rates. It means a sustainable improvement in socioeconomic conditions, growing educational opportunities, improved health, better jobs, and better housing. If we think about the Arab Spring, the experience there was a 6 to 8% growth rate for much of Mubarak's reign. But the lack of inclusion and the inequality led to bad distribution of income and wealth, arrogance, corruption, white elephant infrastructure projects, and a lack of opportunities for youths. At USAID, we're trying to address these concerns in four key ways. First, we're working to create and enforce international norms, working with our own civil society organizations, including many of the activists who are here today, interaction, associations of contractors, human rights groups, women's groups, and so on. At the Busan Development Forum, for example, last year, the United States pressed hard and successfully for including strong language affirming the rights and importance of civil society. Specifically, the document stated, civil society organizations play a vital role in enabling people to claim their own rights, to shape development policies, and to oversee their implementation. Each signatory to that agreement agreed to enable civil society to exercise its roles as independent development actors. But it is, of course, telling that many of the governments that signed that Busan outcome document, and even those who led the drafting exercise, are the very countries that are imposing the strongest draconian measures now. Thus, we're also taking the steps to demand that governments include civil society in formulating all their development strategies and goals, in implementing these programs, and in monitoring their, value, uh, their progress. This is especially true in our programs for rural development and food security under the President's Feed the Future initiative, our child survival efforts under the Global Health Initiative, 
our remediation and adaptation efforts under the Climate Change Initiative, and our humanitarian relief efforts. For example, I'm pleased to note that now every single project at USAID to be considered has to include a gender impact statement that states how that project will advance women's equality and gender rights. Third, we're working directly to create civil society institutions. A growing percentage of our assistance is going directly to reputable, transparent NGOs in developing countries. We're also helping build these organizations. In the Philippines, for example, we have set up an incubator for 120 NGOs in human rights, environmental issues, development, <coughs> trying to create reliable financial, human resource, monitoring, and evaluation systems. The same is true of 315 civil society groups in Cambodia. Similarly, I was pleased to be able to announce at Afad University, that fabulous women's university in Khartoum last year, a new program to empower civil society women to participate in peace processes around the world, providing them training, stipends, and physical protection. Because we all know that the most dangerous profession for a woman is a peace builder. Finally, like my colleagues I I elsewhere in government, we advocate for these groups in meetings with host governments, by speaking out against abuses, by providing financial assistance, and yes, when appropriate, by wrapping the American flag as a protective shield around advocates who want us to do this. We all know that the simple act of meeting with a senior American official, or a member of Congress for that matter, can provide life-saving protection. Mr. Congressman, Madam Congressman, woman, it's hard. No higher purpose exists for the use of American power than to provide a stern reminder for those who would seek to shut down civil society that they are indeed on the wrong side of history. 